Good afternoon and thank you for joining us today for the Peter McCallum Cancer Centre Annual General Meeting for 2020. My name is Shelley Dolan, Peter Mac's Chief Executive, and I'm joined here in the room by our Chair, the Honourable Professor Maxine Morand. May I also extend a very warm welcome to representatives of the Victorian Government and the Department of Health and Human Services, Peter Mac Board Directors and Peter Mac's Executive and Leadership Team, and of course, all the members of our community. I would also especially like to acknowledge our patients and staff who have joined us via video conference today. Welcome also to members of the Peter Mac Foundation, including the Board Chair, Bruce Ackhurst, and Executive Director, Jennifer Dubell, as well as to our very generous supporters. A warm welcome to the Honorary Frank Maguire, Parliamentary Secretary for Medical Research, and Helen Mason, Senior Executive Director of Commissioning Health and Wellbeing Division in the Department of Health and Human Services. Thank you both for joining us this afternoon. To our consumer representatives, our dedicated volunteers, and all members of the Peter Mac community, Thank you for tuning in. We also welcome all of our colleagues um, across Melbourne's Biomedical Precinct, our fellow Victorian Comprehensive Cancer Centre Alliance members and everybody across Victoria. I would now like to introduce Auntie Zeta Thompson and the welcome to country. Mindika Waranjari Valley, Iman Kamdibik. Welcome to the land of the Waranjari people. And I pay my respects to our ancestors and elders of today. I acknowledge the Bunurong tribe who we share parts of Melbourne with. I pay respects to all Aboriginal people right across the country as we all share the same story. I am both of the Wurundjeri tribe from my father and grandfather and the uh, Yorta Yorta tribe from my mother. The Yorta Yorta of the Yalupna clan. And uh, we grew up knowing all our history from our ancestors, all the old ways and uh, language and so forth. So I pay respects to both my the two tribes, Yorta Yorta and uh, Wurundjeri. Pay respects to uh, Bunjo, a creative spirit ancestor, a creator creator of everything in for the Kulin people. I also pay respects to Wa, uh, another spirit creator, um, and comes in the form of a black crow and the keeper of the wind and waterways. Firstly, I acknowledge my grandfather from the Wurundjeri clan, uh, Yarra Yarra clan of the Wurundjeri tribe, who as a young man was forced to leave his homeland on uh, Corranduk Aboriginal Reserve where he was born and as a Yarra Yarra clansman um, in the days of uh, our new visitors coming to our country, first contact, any uh, person with mixed blood was to um, move off the mission station and go out into the wider community and uh, mix of course, they're Aboriginal people with still having their language and their old ways. But my grandfather went to Kamragunja Aboriginal Reserve on the um, Dungala River, the Murray River, and married a Yorta Yorta woman, my nan. 
and have a large family. Aboriginal people have a strong spiritual connection to our land, the water, moon, sun and the stars, and they are all in our stories that we have. Our stories are all around us and you could see all our connection in our artwork today, in our dance and many other ways of connecting to country. We have the oldest living culture on earth, older than the pyramids of uh, Egypt, um, a Chinese, great Chinese wall and many other places right across Europe. Our culture is ancient and we are trying to maintain what is left for us to pass on to our children and grandchildren. Aboriginal people today are self-determined and um, we look forward to making our own decisions in all areas, in government and um, all around us. We want to be able to have a say in the lives of our people, what's good for us. Um, so it's important that we share with you a little bit about our life, thousands of years of who we are today now is because of our past and knowing who we are and welcome to the land of the Wurundjeri people and uh, thank you. This afternoon we will share with you the ways in which everyone at Peter Mac has continued to deliver against our strategic priorities and the vision of Sir Peter McCallum to provide nothing but the best in cancer care. You will hear how we have prioritised research-driven individualised care and demonstrated remarkable resilience and camaraderie throughout the year. As we take you on our 2020 journey through all the projects, successes and developments, I invite you to remember the extraordinary circumstances that we all here in Australia and in Victoria have shared. The first address today will be delivered by our chair, Professor Maxine Morand. I will then share my reflections on the year that was before handing over to Professor Ben Solomon to deliver our keynote address. Before the conclusion of today's event, we will also invite members of our community and the public to ask questions. These will be answered at the end of today's formal proceedings by Professor Miranda and myself. If you would like to ask a question throughout the event, please search for menti.com and enter code 51543777 as you can see on the screen. And this will pop up intermittently throughout this evening's meeting. Formal proceedings will conclude at 5.30. It is now my pleasure to introduce Professor Maxine Morand to deliver the board address. Thank you, Maxine. Thank you very much, Shirley, and good afternoon, everybody. And I'd like to warmly welcome um, everybody, every member of our community this afternoon who have joined us for today's AGM, 2020 AGM. Uh, first of all, I wanted to uh, introduce the Board of Directors at Peter Mac, our Deputy Chair, Associate Professor Leslie Retty, Deidre Blythe, Associate Professor Kate Cherry, Louise Davidson, Ian Dunn, Matt O'Keefe, Pearson and Associate Professor Rosemary McKenzie. On behalf of the Board, I want to express my deep gratitude for your ongoing support and trust in us and in the executive team during this extraordinary year of uncertainty. It's certainly a year none of us will forget. We have one formality to address first, and, and I'm going to call for confirmation of the Peter Mac um, AGM minutes from last year, which have previously been um, circulated to board members. And Ian Dunn, who chaired last year's AGM, has moved them 
and DG Plus has seconded. So thank you all. The minutes of the AGM are now confirmed. So I'm also going to start now with some acknowledgements. And firstly, I am deeply grateful to the commitment of my fellow directors. I thank them for their expertise and the time they have dedicated to Peter Mac, you know, particularly through this incredibly challenging year. And also it is was a pleasure to welcome Associate Professor Rosemary McKenzie as a director from the 1st of July in 2019. The board's governance functions includes the highest quality and safety measures for our patients and staff, as well as finance, audit and risk management and reporting, community advisory services, population health, and of course, world leading research. I'd like to express my gratitude to the executive team led by uh, Shirley Dolan, who joined us from London on 23rd of September last year. And while Shirley came with excellent credentials, and experience working in complex hospital environments, nobody could have been prepared for the challenges of the COVID-19 pandemic. And I really do commend Shelley for her robust leadership and a very calming effect on all of us during this time. She has led the hospital through all of the challenges of the pandemic and was instrumental in driving the delivery of several major projects, which I'll speak about in a minute. I also want to acknowledge the entire executive team and all our staff and volunteers for what they have managed to achieve this year, despite uh, literally a changing environment every single day. I want to acknowledge the Victorian government led by Premier Daniel Andrews and the, the Health Minister and the department for their support during the months of unprecedented uncertainty. I also want to thank all our commercial and research partners and thank you so very much to our funders and donors. We are very grateful for the value that comes from these collaborations. Most importantly, I want to acknowledge our patients and their families and the broader community for which we dedicate all that we do at Peter Mac. So 2020 was an extraordinary year for all of us at Peter Mac, for all Victorians and Australians, and indeed the entire global community. But our focus here at Peter Mac was, of course, on protecting the health and well-being of our patients and our people. For Peter Mac in 2020 was also defined by the development of a refreshed five-year strategy and the headway we made on major projects, including the launch of our prostate theranostics and imaging centre, the lead up to the opening of our new palliative care unit and the digitalisation of medical recording, record keeping and service delivery, of course, the EMR. So firstly, the EMR, I really want to congratulate all that were involved in the lead up to the launch of the EMR across the Parkville precinct on the 8th of August. Implementing such an enormous project under what were unique and difficult circumstances was no small feat. It was scheduled for May and we deferred in anticipation of a surge of COVID presentations in that time period. When its second go late date arrived, we were actually at the peak of the COVID cases and yet staff were able to successfully implement and transition to the EMR across the entire precinct. An exceptional achievement. And of course, the, the launch is only the beginning of what is a very long-term project, uh, which aims to use the flow of real-time data to inform care and improve patient outcomes uh, in the future. The palliative care unit, so not long after the EMR, was launched on the 14th of September, we opened the doors to Peter Max Palliative Care Unit and the precinct focused initiatives initiative. While the project culminated after the completion of the 2019-20 financial year, which is what I'm reporting on today, much of the work was undertaken many months before and pleasingly early feedback from families, staff and the community on this specialised unit has been immensely positive. I would like to acknowledge the Victorian Government for understanding the need for a palliative care ward in this comprehensive cancer centre and providing funding to realise that vision. May I also acknowledge the Sony, the Sony Foundation for the generous support they provided, helping to fit out the two beds that were specifically designed for young people within the palliative care unit. Also, over the past 12 months, progress has been made towards the installation of a gamma knife at our Parkville campus. A gamma knife is a radiotherapy machine widely accepted as providing the best standard in radiosurgery for adults and children with brain tumours. The gamma knife was secured through funding from the generous donors to the Peter Mac uh, Foundation and the Victorian Government. 
It was officially open, in fact, this morning by the Victorian Minister for Health, the Honourable Martin Foley. And it is the it is the only gamma knife in Victoria, and this treatment will save lives and improve the quality of life for some of the states and indeed some of Australia's most unwell cancer patients. We begin operations of the palliative of the gamma knife in February. Immunotherapy advances were made in the area of immunotherapy with Peter Mac continuing to be a national leader in work to bring about CAR T cell therapies to Australians through clinical trials and advocacy for local manufacturing along with our partners. The clinical application of these emerging immunotherapy and targeted radioactive cancer treatments will have a significant impact on outcomes for patients with blood cancer. During the 12 month period, 12, 24 patients were treated with first approved standard of care commercial CAR-T Kimraya for leukemia and aggressive lymphoma. And during the peak of this activity, we had 13 CAR-T clinical trials underway. For future patients with prostate cancer will also benefit from accelerated research and development of next generation targeted treatments made possible by the launch of the new Centre for Excellence in June this year. The Prostate Theranostics and Imaging Centre of Excellence, so-called PROSTIC, was established with the support of a 5 million US grant from the US-based Prostate Cancer Foundation and the incredibly generous philanthropy of Mr. Stein Eric Hagen, a Prostate Cancer Foundation board member. We are very grateful for that support. So PROSTIC is, of course, just one addition to the abundance of achievements from our re research workforce, despite the precautionary reduction of in-lab research activity during the pandemic. Many of our 700 strong team of researchers received fellowships, medals for outstanding research and numerous other accolades, demonstrating our unwavering commitment to leadership and discovery and the importance of research-led cancer care. Truly an, an outstanding achievement. During the COVID-19 pandemic, Peter Mac also took a leadership role in the advocacy of continued cancer care, engaging with the media, stakeholders and patients directly to encourage the continuation of high quality cancer treatment and diagnostic testing. Throughout, Peter Mac continued to provide critical cancer treatments, including surgery, radiation therapy, hematological therapies, chemotherapy, hormone therapy and immunotherapy, including, of course, CAR-T therapy. So alongside all this work that's uh, been going on in the year, um, much thought and cons consultation worked into the development of Peter Mac's strategy for the next five years. And the Strategic Directions 2020-25 document is complete. Uh, we, hope, we were hoping to be able to release it today, um, but it's still with the department and with the minister, but it will be imminently available. And of course, you can be reassured that our strategy will continue our focus on research-led world's best cancer care for our patients. I'd like to take this opportunity to acknowledge the essential role of our donors and supporters and the role they continue to play. In 1920, uh, the, in that year, the Peter Mac Cancer Foundation contributed more than $25.5 million to support Peter Mac. This included seed funding provided in September 2019 for 22 groundbreaking, groundbreaking cancer research projects, with a total of $1.1 million being awarded to new cancer research initiatives. And it was really inspiring to see that more than 3,200 people registered to participate in the Foundation's major event, Unite to Fight Cancer. With the support of nearly 25,000 sponsors, participants ran, rode or walked their way to raising more than $1.8 million for vital cancer research. Peter Mac Research continues to attract grants, fund, grants funding with nearly $20 million from the National Health and Medical Research Council's investigative grants allocated to 12 different Peter Mac projects commencing in 2020. This was the first tranche of many such grants and in fact in the past financial year Peter Mac Research attracted total income of nearly $115 million. And I really want to take this opportunity to acknowledge uh, the exceptional leadership of Professor Ricky Johnson and his research executive and indeed the whole research team for managing to work so effectively through incredibly challenging work environment during the state's response to the COVID-19 pandemic. So finally, before I 
I hand back to Shelley. I am pleased on behalf of the board directors to release to the public the 1920 Peter Mac annual report, which was tabled in Parliament recently. The report includes information on Peter Mac's performance, progress and outcomes over that year. And it also delves deeper into our strategy, providing an assessment of our performance against the Peter Mac strategic directions and the statement of our priorities agreed with the Victorian Minister for Health. And the annual report sheds light on what Peter Mac's purpose and values, highlighting why it is we do what we do and how we plan to keep improving to be the best we can be. And a digital version of the annual report is now available on our website. So thanks again, everybody, for joining us today. And I'm going to finish by introducing a highlights reel from the past year. Thank you, everybody. Thank you, Maxine. I would like to express my gratitude to many people for their significant contribution, 
this year and the many achievements that Maxine has described. Firstly, I want to thank every one of our 3,203 employees and 170 volunteers, especially our frontline teams, including PSAs, receptionists, nurses, allied health professionals, clinical teams, and everyone who has contributed so significantly this year. Throughout this extraordinary year, we have seen many examples of the Peter Mac values excellence, innovation and compassion. We have witnessed strength, courage, pain, resilience, openness to change, camaraderie and good humour and above all demonstrations of empathy for our patients and each other. I want to thank all of our patients and families for their patience, understanding and cooperation, especially at the most difficult times. Thank you too to our colleagues at the Department of Health and Human Services, to the Victorian Health Minister, the Federal Health Minister and the Victorian and Commonwealth Governments. So I'm now going to reflect back and I don't have time to mention everybody and all of the achievements this year, but I certainly want to highlight a few. So 2020 started, as you will remember, with one of the worst bushfire seasons in history. And then we all watched as the first waves of the COVID-19 pandemic started to hit countries across the world. There has undoubtedly been challenge and uncertainty, but I hope I can show you that it has also been a transformative year and one that proved how very difficult times bring out the very best in our people. <clears throat> this evening, I would like to provide you with a glimpse into the last 12 months and the many, many ways in which everyone at Peter Mac continued together to deliver the best of cancer care, but also to rise to the challenge of a global pandemic, offering support and services across the precinct, but also across Victoria. As a specialist cancer, health service with no emergency department or aged care facilities, we immediately saw our role beyond that of cancer care as a support to our colleagues across the precinct and particularly the Royal Melbourne. We determined as an executive team that we would ensure the continuity of the best cancer care, but above and beyond that, if we could assist with anything in Victoria, that is what we would do. And I remember in one of our first town hall meetings, when we were still able to meet in person on level 13, I explained this view to probably about 250 of our staff. And there was immediate and loud support. And several people shouted out, don't worry, Shelley, we've got this. In this, my first year at Peter Mac, I have been continuously reminded of how amazing all of our teams are. This afternoon, you will have to forgive me that I can only give a brief glimpse into their generosity and spirit. Very early in the first wave, our pathology team were called upon to assist the Royal Melbourne and the testing program. This is the first example of a team who did not hesitate. And I want to give particular thanks to Stephen Fox, Peter Gamble and Dominic Wall our whole pathology team who worked tirelessly externally and internally to ensure teams were safe and testing was delivered. Next, I want to acknowledge our clinical directors who immediately set to work on the, under the leadership of our Chief Operating Officer, Nicole Tweddle, to redesign our cancer programmes to ensure we continu could continue giving the best cancer care for as long as possible here at Parkville and across all of our radiotherapy campus. I must pay tribute to our infection prevention and control team led by Dr Leon Worth and Elizabeth Gillespie, whose calm, authoritative, expert leadership was a sustaining force, especially in times of heightened anxiety, both internally but also supporting other health services when requested. Operationally, Peter Mac adapted quickly 
to the delivery of cancer care amid rapid change. With an imperative to ensure operational continuity, scenario planning was undertaken in line with guidance from the Victorian and Australian governments and also the World Health Organization. A COVID-19 instant team was set up in mid-March with senior operation from all sorry, senior representation from all operational research and clinical areas to ensure the rapid resolution of issues as they arose. Processes were reorganized to allow more than a thousand staff to work from home. Significant adjustments were required from our patients, their families and our people to ensure we continue to deliver the highest quality cancer care. Here I want also to acknowledge the incredible leadership of our Executive Director of Research, Professor Ricky, Professor Ricky Johnston, Carol Gins and the whole research leadership team. Right at the beginning of the first wave, they were incredibly diligent in following the Chief Health Officer and Premier's advice. And at some personal cost, they immediately arranged for most of their teams to work from home but they also volunteered to support our clinical teams on the wards and specialist clinics. Right through the first and second wave as a health service, we all met virtually. And I remember the many tributes to our amazing scientists who worked supporting our nurses, doctors and allied health professionals on the wards. Despite all of these challenges, as Maxine has just said, our research teams achieved a total of nearly 800 publications, many of which were in high impact journals. They led 320 active clinical trials and successfully applied for many grants and received many national and international awards. Now I want to pay tribute to our people and culture team. It was very clear early on that one of the most important areas for us to set up was a wellbeing support team for everyone at Peter Mac. Under the leadership of the then Executive Director Helen Havenga and Jerry McDonald, they were tireless in providing practical support and help with everything from parking, childcare and leave entitlements. At the same time, it was clear that we needed the support of expert mental health practitioners. And here I want to say a huge thank you to Professor Steve Allen and Maria Fatanou and the psycho-oncology teams for setting up our regular well-being sessions, where we all learnt how to manage our own anxiety and understand what everyone was going through. I remember those early personal tips from the team. It seems such a long time ago now, not to listen to endless COVID reports and not to listen to the news just before bedtime. And to remember that everyone was getting emotionally stressed and to remember that as we worked with our colleagues. During the year, we cared for over, um, we looked after over 41,000 individual stays with patients in the hospital. And in the height of the pandemic, we reached a peak of 63% of clinic appointments being delivered virtually. And here I want to thank our ICT director, Emmy, and her team for her, their tireless leadership, ensuring the telehealth conversion, but also ensuring over 1,000 of our people could work from home. One of the very hardest challenge for all of us was to face the fact that we had to severely limit visitors to our inpatients. But here again, Peter Mac people triumphed. Following an appeal during one of my virtual sessions, through the leadership of Anne Francie Ford and Lynn Dresens, our volunteers got to work and we had virtual visitors set up almost overnight. And then to my absolute delight and huge gratitude, two of our brilliant radiation therapists under the leadership of Nilgun Tuma, Nigel Anderson and Daniel Sapkorowski adapted the virtual reality ha headsets that they had invented for their radiotherapy patients to a disposable version for inpatients to make their time more bearable with distraction. I think that goes to show a lot about the ingenuity, compassion and excellence of our people here at Peter Mac. 
everyone on the hospital incident team played an incredible part. But I just want to acknowledge Dana Peters and Amanda and the whole procurement team. They kept us all safe. We were always provided with personal protective equipment and were early initiators of fit testing the 95 masks following DHHS advice. Thank you. I want to now pay tribute to the leaders in the DHHS. As someone who has only been in Australia for just over a year, I really want to pay tribute to the incredible leadership that I have found here. To the leadership of the Premier, Daniel Andrews and his health ministers. To the Chief Health Officer, Brett Sutton. To Terry Simons, Helen Mason, Ben Fielding, Ryan Heath and many others who were unceasing in their calm, expert advice and were instrumental in providing regular, important information to us so that we could distribute that onwards. I know they all worked incredible hours to support us and everyone at Peter Mac and across Victoria is very grateful to you. I could spend all evening, couldn't I, thanking so many people at Peter Mac, but just a couple of last mentions. During the second wave, Terry Simons rang me one weekend and asked if we would be prepared to lead the Hotel for Heroes programme. This meant providing safe accommodation for any frontline staff across Victoria. I rang our executive team that night and again without delay, our executive director for clinical governance and projects, Lisa Dunlop, immediately agreed. So on top of her uh, normal job, Lisa led together with uh, Jerry McDonald, Kylie Thichner, Danny Dawes, Steve Ellen, Leon Worth and Elizabeth Gillespie. They got to work and with incredible expertise and grace, provided care for over 1,500 frontline Victorians who scored the service they uh, received above 85% for overall safety and satisfaction. I must pay tribute to our chief nurse, Jack Matheson, who again very willingly responded to the call to assist all of Victoria. And she has worked in the department clinically leading on the workforce response and personally assisting in aged care. While she also ensured the International Gap Conference became a reality, but more of that in a moment. Communications. Throughout my career, I have always found that information and communication is of paramount importance during any major incident. And of course, this major incident has lasted for a very long time. I therefore want to acknowledge our brilliant communications team and director Vanessa O'Shaughnessy, whose expert support has been absolutely critical over the past year. Finally, I want to acknowledge our chair and board of directors for their constant support. Maxine has been a wonderful support to me personally and no more so during the pandemic when I knew that she was always available. Maxine often joined us for virtual town hall meetings and I know it meant a lot for all of us to know that although our board chair and directors couldn't physically be with us, they were and are a constant support. <clears throat> we finished the year by hosting the Global Academic Partners 2020 Conference or GAP. And here again, I acknowledge the leadership of Jack Matheson, who redesigned the conference with colleagues from across the United States to be hosted virtually for the first time by Australia in partnership with MD Anderson Cancer Center in Texas. They brought together over 1,885 delegates from more than 48 countries. The conference aims to foster through collaboration the development of impactful, innovative ideas to end cancer globally. As I hope I have sketched out a little, this year has been a perfect example of that collaboration and generous leadership by very many people. Such collaboration, I believe, is the lifeblood of a specialist health service. And I'm very grateful for the friendship fun and partnership from all our health service, biomedical research and university colleagues in Parkville and across Victoria. 
We will now see a short video that provides a useful overview of the key achievements and outcomes of the year just gone. Thank you, comms team. Another example of the incredible work that the team do for us um, constantly throughout the year. Before introducing our keynote speaker, I thought I would end by reminding us of the words of our founder, Sir Peter McCallum, which continue to resonate for us today. 71 years ago, Sir Peter said this, we are a cancer center unsurpassed in the world where humanity, caring service and relentless research share equal value. Nothing but the best is good enough in the treatment of cancer. I hope we've demonstrated it today and in our outcomes across the year that those sentiments still hold true. We are a passionate team of people here at Peter Mac who strive for excellence, innovation and compassion in everything we do. And one individual who exemplifies this constant pursuit of excellence and improvement of treatment outcomes for patients is Professor Ben Solomon. 
Professor Solomon is a medical oncologist in our lung and head and neck service. Professor Solomon is the group leader of the Molecular Therapeutics and Biomarkers Laboratory in the Research Division, and he is internationally renowned for his translational lung cancer research. We are incredibly lucky that he returned to us in 2006 from the University of Colorado. It is now my pleasure to invite us all to listen to Professor Ben Solomon delivering the keynote address. Thanks very much. Um, my name is Ben Solomon. I'm a medical oncologist here at Peter Mac. It's my privilege to talk to you about some of the remarkable advances that we've seen in the treatment of lung cancer in recent years. And in particular, to share with you some of the um, clinical trials that we've um, been involved with here at Peter Mac that have led to some of these uh, changes. But I'd first like to start with some numbers about lung cancer. Lung cancer is the most commonly diagnosed cancer. It, there are about 2 million new cases of lung cancer diagnosed around the world, over 12,000 new cases of lung cancer diagnosed in Australia. And it accounts for more cancer-related deaths than any other cancer uh, in Australia or worldwide, accounting for about 19% of all cancer-related deaths. There is some good news though for lung cancer. We have seen, albeit from a very low baseline, improvements in five-year survival over recent times. Some of this is due to earlier diagnosis of lung cancer, but much of it is due to improved treatments. And I hope to share some of, uh, some of the good news stories in this respect with you today. Not that long ago, um, all lung cancer was treated in pretty much the same way. More recently, we've begun to appreciate that lung cancer is not just one disease. If you look down the microscope, you can recognize different histological subtypes. And perhaps more importantly, if you look at tumors at a, on a molecular level, you can identify different oncogenic drivers. In adenocarcinoma, which is the most common histological type, it's possible to identify molecular drivers in more than half of these tumors. And if you're fortunate enough to have a drug that targets these outcomes, you can deliver what truly is personalized medicine and improve outcomes for patients. And I'll be sharing with you um, some trials we've done uh, that have targeted a particular gene called ALK. Now, ALK takes its name from anaplastic uh, large cell lymphoma kinase, or ALK stands for anaplastic large cell lymphoma kinase. It, um, it's, it takes its name from an unusual um, T cell lymphoma um, in which um, uh, alterations in a gene which has subsequently been called ALK uh, uh, is, is found. In 2007, researchers working in Japan identified that a subset of non-small cell lung cancers had the same gene rearrangement. It turns out that about 3 to 5% of lung cancers have this alteration. It tends to be found in uh, tumors that are of adenocarcinoma histology. It tends to be found in younger patients. The median age of patients diagnosed with ALK rearrangements is about 50. And it tends to occur in never or light smokers. And what, um, what the researchers uh, originally in Japan, but subsequently around the world have found um, is that in the lab, tumors with these um, uh, alterations are very sensitive to drugs called um, ALK inhibitors, which block signaling through ALK. In 2007, the same year that ALK rearrangements were identified in lung cancer, we began this trial, a phase one trial with a drug called crizotinib. Crizotinib was designed um, to target another gene called um, CMET, but it also happened that it uh, was a very potent inhibitor of um, uh, this ALK gene. So at the time the trial was um, started, we put a lot of e effort into identifying tumors with ALK rearrangements. And with the help of um, the folk in molecular pathology, in particular Stephen Fox, 
we were able to set up an assay to identify ALK rearrangements in tumours. And in this study, which was conducted at Peter Mac and at several centres around the world, we saw that um, that most patients treated most patients whose tumours had ALK rearrangements when treated with this uh, this drug had shrinkage in their tumours, and sometimes the shrinkages were pretty pretty remarkable, as you can see in the PET scan shown here. Um, results were confirmed in a phase two study, which was uh, which was also done at Peter Mac, and this led to um, accelerated approval by the US FDA in uh, 2011. We subsequently went on to do um, a study comparing um, upfront treatment with crizotinib um, to the pre-existing standard of care, which was chemotherapy. So in this large global phase three study, patients with newly diagnosed ALK rearranged lung cancer were randomized to treatment either with crizotinib or to chemotherapy. And the study was strongly positive in favor of crizotinib. And this led to approval of crizotinib by the PBS in Australia in 2014 and made testing for ALK rearrangements and treatment with upfront ALK tyrosine kinase inhibitors standard of care for ALK rearranged lung cancer. We also showed that compared to historical survival in the order with historical survival, which had been poor in the order of a median survival of about 12 months, with treatment with tyrosine kinase inhibitors, patients were able to live with median survivals in excess of four years with treatment with uh, crizotinib and similar drugs. We do know, however, that tumors can become resistant to crizotinib and progression of um, disease can occur, in, particularly in the brain. So there have been newer, more potent ALK inhibitors developed, so-called second and third generation inhibitors. And these compounds have in common that they're more potent against ALK and against mutations that confer resistance to crizotinib. And they're also much better at getting into the brain. One of these um, inhibitors um, the, uh, is a drug called lolatinib, uh, which is a so-called third generation inhibitor. It's got a unique structure which makes it um, very, um, a very compact molecule, which is very good at getting into the brain but also uh, very good at accessing the ALK tyrosine kinase inhibitor, even in the context of mutations that cause resistance to other compounds. So we did a phase one and two study with lorlatinib, which started in 2014. And the study had um, multiple different arms in phase two, including an arm where patients whose disease had progressed on prior drugs were treated with, um, um, with lorlatinib. And uh, on the basis of um, this study, patient uh, lorlatinib was approved for patients who had progressed on prior ALK inhibitors. And results are shown here with uh, response rates in the order of 40% um, in patients um, whose disease had progressed after uh, treatment with prior inhibitors and chemotherapy and response rates um, of over 50% in the brain. And this led to FDA approval in 2018 and PBS um, listing of lorlatinib early this year. Um, this is an example of a patient who was referred um, to the trial who's uh, kindly allowed me to share his story with you. Um, uh, this patient is a 32-year-old man who had never smoked, who was diagnosed with um, advanced ALK-positive lung cancer in 2014. He began treatment with a drug called seritinib, a second-generation inhibitor, which initially worked well, but his disease started to progress despite the seritinib. And he was referred for um, the trial that, um, that I just mentioned. Unfortunately, his disease progressed very rapidly and he presented with seizures to the emergency department uh, at the Royal Melbourne across the road. His scan shown here, he had multiple um, large brain metastases with midline shift. He required urgent surgery to uh, resect the largest metastasis and commenced treatment on lolatinib, um, which we, we were able to access through a compassionate access scheme. Um, he also happened to get married uh, on the rooftop, on the seventh floor rooftop um, uh, within days of starting this compound. 
He started in 2016 and his scans um, just a few weeks ago shows that he maintains a complete response to the drug in his brain and elsewhere. And he sent me this photo um, last month of uh, a hiking trip he did in the mountains of Tasmania, uh, four years after his presentation to the emergency department with seizures. So we've gone on since then to do a, a phase three study looking at the role of lolatinib in the first line study, uh, first line setting uh, you, in this study, which is called the Crown Study. Patients were randomized to, with newly diagnosed ALK positive lung cancer were randomized to treatment with lolatinib or to crizotinib. The study was strongly positive. The response rate was 76% um, in the patients treated with lolatinib compared to 58% in patients treated with crizotinib. And the progression-free survival um, was, um, uh, was strongly um, positive in favor of lolatinib um, with a median progression-free survival that had not been reached for lolatinib compared to 9.3 months with crizotinib with a hazard ratio of 0.28. Um, the drug was particularly active in patients with brain metastases, which accounted for about 25% 20, of patients um, on the study. The response rate to lolatinib was 82% um, in the brain um, in, pa in uh, patients with measurable brain metastases who received lolatinib compared to 23% in patients who received crizotinib. And 71% of patients had a complete intracranial response to lolatinib. And what we were also able to show was that lolatinib um, not only was able to treat and um, uh, shrink established brain metastases, but it also prevented the development of new brain metastases. Um, and as shown here, significantly prolongs time to intracranial progression with a hazard ratio of 0 0.07, with very few patients treated with lolatinib uh, developing progression of their disease in the brain. And these results um, have been published uh, last month in the New England Journal. And what really is remarkable is the effect um, that these drugs have had um, in terms of survival in this patient population. We've seen survival that's previously been measured in years, um, moving to timeframes previously measured in months, I should say, historically, um, improving to survival that's measured in years with um, hopefully further gains um, being brought with, uh, with improved uh, drugs. This is a photo of a cake that one of our patients brought to a recent um, uh, lung clinic. Uh, this cake was to was a patient who was enrolled in one of our crizotinib trials many years ago and marked his 10-year anniversary from the diagnosis of lung cancer. And I hope with the ongoing trials that we have and the better treatments, we'll see many more significant anniversaries like this um, being marked in, in the future. And finally, I'd like to thank um, all the patients and their families who have participated in the trials which have been so important for advancing treatments for lung cancer, and to thank um, the Peter Mac uh, trials team um, involved in these trials. And finally, to thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, Professor Solomon. We have had a wonderful history lesson this week and last week um, because we had the huge treat of listening to Professor David Ball describe the last 47 years of treatment for lung cancer and it is wonderful today to hear the massive advances that are being made. So thank you again Professor Solomon. Your work on behalf of everyone with lung cancer is very impressive indeed. Now we enter the part of the proceedings where we ask members of the public or members of our hospital community to ask questions and seek information from the board or the hospital executive. Just a reminder, if you would like to ask a question, please go to menti.com and your, in your internet browser 
and enter the code 51543777 and you can then type in your question. We'll wait just a few minutes, a uh, moment, sorry, to ensure anyone who can wishes to submit a question and then these will be read out loud. So I can see that we have one question already, Jai. <coughs> uh, so there's a question here. There's also a nice comment. It says, thanks to Dr. Dolan for her excellent leadership in this difficult year. Thank you. Um, but I always like to point out that um, everything we do is about teamwork, isn't it? But thank you very much for the kind comments. Uh, and there's a question here that says, we have heard about people not getting their cancer checks during the year. Do you think you'll be inundated next year and how are you preparing for that? Yes, I do think we'll be um, inundated next year. In fact, we have already seen the start um, of what we're calling the surge of people returning uh, to seek treatment. Um, and what are we doing about it? That's really important. So at Peter Mac, uh, we have already looked at putting on extra uh, diagnostic hours and tests so that we can ensure that we keep diagnostics going uh, quickly and effectively. And we will also be looking at how we treat more patients effectively here at Peter Mac. But actually, this is importantly um, being spread across the whole of Victoria. And I want to pay tribute again um, to my VCCC colleagues and particularly Grant MacArthur. Uh, he and I have worked very closely on this with other clinical leaders because this is an issue that we will need to tackle together across the whole of Victoria. So a really important problem. Yes, um, it's really important that we do see uh, a lot of people next year and that throughout Victoria we were we are able to ensure um, quick access to excellent cancer care. A few more questions have come in. The <clears throat> next one says there's been some recent media coverage regarding the limited research funding available. Is funding availability getting worse? If so, how will Peter Mac manage this? Shall I start that yeah. one, Maxine? So, um, yes, this is something that we have been discussing uh, with other research leaders across Australia and across Victoria. And I know um, that the research community is concerned about this and um, we're particularly concerned, I think, about what we call fundamental research or, or sometimes called basic research, uh, which for us is so incredibly important. Um, fundamental research is the research that takes place typically in laboratories, and it's the whole ideas generation that has to, that starts there and um, before it can be translated into new drugs, for example, as uh, Ben Solomon has described, new radiotherapy treatments, new surgery treatments. But that amazing concept and, and ideas start with fundamental research. And we are concerned about research funding and ensuring that we can continue to deliver um, you know, over 330 clinical trials a year so that we continue to improve care for people with cancer. Uh, what are we doing about that at Peter Mac? Um, we're doing everything we can um, to work with uh, grant awarding bodies and, uh, and I must say we've had some fantastic support and collaborations with them. Um, and we're doing everything we can to support our incredible researchers. But this year has been a very difficult one for the whole research community. And we are keen that we look at every methodology possible to improve funding over the next few years. And we are part of um, uh, AMRI, uh, which is um, the Australian Association for Medical Research Institutes and we're also very heavily involved in Vic Amory, so Victorian Amory, and we are very grateful for their leadership and support. I just want to just to add, add to that and nothing much to add Shelley because you've uh, answered that really well but the NHMRC IDEAS grants were released today and the success rate was um, just under 10 percent 
Um, so it's a very poor success rate and we're very conscious of, you know, incredible research that is mis missed out on receiving funding. But when you look at the entire amount of funding that's been provided, it's actually increased from last year. So there is more money going in, but there's also more applications for research and therefore a lower success rate. Um, so we are advocating as strongly as we can to make sure as many um, grants as possible can be funded. Thank you. Thanks. Yeah. Uh, there's just another nice comment. Wonderful to see the impact of Peter Mac leadership on lung cancer, a big challenge, Peter Mac leading the way. Yes, it's so important, isn't it? I remember um, as quite a young nurse working um, in a medical oncology ward uh, in London, and lung cancer was, you know, it was, I think uh, David Ball described it as there was a lot of nihilism associated with lung cancer. And it is still a very difficult disease. But we now have, you know, compared to 30 years ago for me, 47 years ago for David Ball, we now have such a lot of uh, treatment modalities that we can apply. And that means hope for people with cancer and particularly lung cancer. So it is a hugely exciting time. And as you say, fantastic that Peter Mack is leading the way. Uh, there's one more that has come in. Thank you, Peter Mack, for always giving safe and high quality care um, during COVID or not. What are some of the COVID experiences which you think will lead to far reaching changes in the cancer care? Yeah, good question. Um, so one of the ones that's been talked about a lot is the availability of telehealth. So um, working um, across um, Victoria, but also across Australia and enabling access uh, for people further away um, from metro areas. Um, we're keen that we're careful with telehealth. Um, it is really important um, that patients are enabled to see their clinicians for important parts of their cancer diagnosis and journey and also have access to the whole multidisciplinary team, to their nurse specialists and to um, allied health professionals such as dietitians and physios, for example. But I think telehealth has a really important place um, in the treatment journey of people with cancer. And we have seen fantastic investment and support for telehealth. So I'm hoping that the whole of virtual care, of which telehealth is one component, will be really improved um, through the catalyst of the pandemic. And I think the other um, major thing that I would point to is the way that we have all worked together. So as you know, in Victoria, clusters of health services came together around the pandemic response. But we are going to take those forward now to address particularly deferred care and to improve care closer to home. So that's another example of, of an um, initiative that was started because of the pandemic and actually I think will lead to much improved accessibility of care for all Victorians. That's all the questions. So I think that's the end of our questions. So it just falls to me now to make um, a couple of closing remarks. Thank you everyone for your participation in today's proceedings. Thank you very much to our chair, Professor Maxine Morand. That brings to a close the formal proceedings of the 2020 Peter McCallum Cancer Centre Annual General Meeting. The outcomes and achievements highlighted this afternoon are testament to the work done every day to deliver on our vision. But the really brilliant thing is there's always more to do, more discoveries to be made, more patients and growing communities to serve. We look forward to continuing to serve Victorians and those across Australia into 2021 and beyond. On behalf of the board and Peter Mack, I would like to thank you very much for joining us. Good evening, thank you. <laughs>